Welcome to Worship with Oakhurst United Methodist Church here online. We're glad that you could join us. There's just a few announcements before we carry on with the rest of our service. First, you can find us on Facebook and on YouTube. If you found us on either of those places this morning, especially on YouTube, please like and subscribe to our channel there and you'll be updated on all of our future postings. On Facebook, we'd ask you to like and share and become a follower of our Oakhurst United Methodist Church Facebook page if you are not already. You'll find throughout the week that especially on Facebook, where Pastor Tim hosts a daily prayer time at 1130, that there's a lot of offerings going on. On Tuesdays and Thursdays on Facebook and YouTube, you can access in the afternoon a bite-sized Bible study. Right now, I'm leading a study of the Gospel of Matthew. Stephanie Fergenbaum is also posting on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays what are called Just for Kids Chats. These are short three to five minute videos designed to help kids think about life from a faith perspective. All right, we have a lot going on in the church. One of the things I have been especially asked to lift up is our community table out front. Our community table exists to help those who are finding this to be a difficult time with scarcity of options in the grocery store or difficult time economically in providing food for their family. This table has supplies dropped off at it throughout the week and picked up by those in need. We would really appreciate your help in keeping that well stocked and maintained. It's a drive through sort of drive by table and our missions team has been very active in overseeing that. We want to make sure that we give them a great big thanks for that. Before we get into the rest of the service, right now would be a great time for you to pause this video if you're watching in that format and fill out a registration information card. You can do this a few ways. The first way is to just comment on the video that you're watching. You can comment, I'm here, I'm enjoying this worship service, or it's great to worship with you this morning, and we'll mark your registration that way. But our preferred method is if you would download our Oakhurst UMC app. Once you download that app from the App Store or the Google Play Store, you'll find when you open it up, the second banner on the home page of the app is an attendance and prayer request card. You can fill this out and mark your attendance. Let us know what worship service you're joining us at, but we can also receive prayer requests this way, which we pass along to our prayer team throughout the course of the week. So please make sure you download that app. Please make sure you fill out that attendance and prayer request card so that we can be here in ministry for you. You're going to hear from Dave Kirkwood, one of our certified lay ministers next, and he's bringing our call to worship. Please join me in our call to worship. We pray in God's name, who is our provider, our redeemer, and our sustainer. We attend this church today via the internet, rejoicing in our recognition of Mother's Day. We have come to you celebrating the role of our mothers have played in our lives, and we thank God for the present love and memories of our mothers and grandmothers. But we also acknowledge that we are needing you in different ways. Some of us need strength because we are facing big challenges. Some of us need hope because we are feeling like giving up. Some of us need love because we are feeling alone. Some of us need healing because we are sick and hurting. Some of us need work because unemployment has taken our jobs. Some of us are hungry because we can't afford food for ourselves or our families. Some of us need our apartments, even our houses, because we have lost them, unable to pay our rent and our mortgages. Some of us need encouragement because we have not communed with Jesus in prayer or in study of the word. We are in need of your company. We bring these needs to the throne of grace and we trust and believe that you will provide for us through the words of music or in a quiet moment of reflection and prayer and through the pastor's sermon. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power and let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. You are here. You are always with us. Amen.
it's time for this morning's pastoral prayer. This morning, I'm going to pray about something that may be a little bit unusual or unconventional, but it's something I've been dealing with uh, over the last um, couple of weeks. Uh, many of you may think that, uh, you know, Satan doesn't exist, but my experience is that there, just as there is a Holy Spirit, there is an unholy spirit. And uh, people experience the reality of angels. I know one or two folks personally who have seen an angel. Uh, <clears throat> and I think that there are probably also uh, spirits that are similar to angels, uh, unholy and evil. Uh, I know that's kind of a, an odd thing perhaps for many people, but it's been my experience and so I want to pray against that today, <clears throat> and also uh, because we don't know the exact cause of the coronavirus, but we certainly do know that the outcome of it and the result of it is certainly evil in terms of the death and the destruction that it's causing. So I'm going to pray against evil this morning. I want to invite you to bow your heads now and pray along silently with me as I pray this morning's pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, in the beginning, before anything existed, you spoke and brought creation into being. You made the earth good, and you made human beings innocent. But in time, sin crept in. Evil took form in spirit and then multiplied. And now the evil spirit and his like roam the earth looking for those that they may afflict, those that they may corrupt, those that they may devour or destroy. Looking to promote uh, hate in whatever way they can. Lord, in every way, evil is the opposite of good and your opposite God because you are good and the source of all goodness. So we remember that evil is the opposite of you. Lord, in your grace, in your love for us and your compassion, you made a way for us to defeat the powers of evil in this world. You've given us the name of Jesus Christ, which alone has the power to drive away spiritual evil. You've given us your Holy Spirit to be our shield and protection from the fiery darts that the evil one flings against us. And you've given us your Spirit to also fill us with the light of Christ. And the light of Christ drives away the darkness of evil that ha hides in the shadows of human hearts and human lives. Lord, with your Holy Spirit inside us, we truly are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And we thank you, Lord, for the conquering power of your Holy Spirit inside us to give us peace and strength to overcome the destructive power of fear and of doubt and of worry. Lord Jesus, you told us we can't uh, add a minute to our lives by worrying about it. So we ought to just trust in God's love and God's care and protection for us. We know that this trust comes to us as we open our heart up to you and to your Holy Spirit. So we try now to open our heart up that your spirit would come in and rest in us. Lord, we also remember that the cross of Jesus and the resurrection are an example to us of the kind of cosmic joke that you played on the spiritual forces of evil. And the joke is that every time evil shows its head, um, the name of Christ brings triumph. Uh, even though evil is real, and we do see it sometimes in people and in spiritual ways, whenever we do see evil, the joke on Satan is that evil is repugnant to us. 
we see its destructiveness, we see the damage that it causes, we see the pain and the suffering that evil causes. And it's disgusting to us. It motivates us to turn to the good and to love and to joy that we get through you. And so that's the joke on Satan. Whenever he shows himself, the result is to drive people closer to you. And Lord, we do choose to live life in relationship with you. We do choose to be your children, to be disciples and followers of your son. And we do choose, Lord, to be faithful in trying to obey your commandments, in trying to serve you and being the people that you want us to be. So, Lord, we pray that you truly would uh, pour out your Holy Spirit on each of us now, that you would help us to base ourselves in your Holy Spirit, that you would surround us with your Holy Spirit to protect us from going in any wrong directions, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. We pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, give us your light, your peace, your joy, through the power of the Holy Spirit inside us. And Lord, cover us with your Holy Spirit to protect us from anyone or anything that would do us harm. So Lord, all these things we pray and we thank you for in Jesus' name. And we pray to you together now as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There is a truth older than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation. Jesus. There is
Let's hear today's scripture from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Let us pray together. Almighty God, as we struggle through this time in our lives as we face a lot of nothing some days, Lord, we would ask that we would remain in your presence, that we would remain aware of your spirit with us, that we would continue to feel blessed by having you with us. We ask this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. I'm sitting back in here in the sanctuary, and this place holds a special meaning for me. I think over the course of my life and my ministry, this special space calls to mind all of the familiar memories, the pleasant ghosts of congregations past where I have worshiped God, where I have felt the presence of the Holy Spirit where I have worked so hard for the kingdom of God alongside faithful brothers and sisters of Christ. I can see the face of those I have loved and labored with and even served in ministry filling these pews here. And yet as I look out, I don't see any of that in this place right now. It's almost as if I'm staring into a giant void, a cosmic black hole within my own self that, that draws into orbit all of the memories, all of the, the feelings the spaces such as this one have elicited and built up in me over the years. There's a feeling, a longing within me to see your face here today and if I'm being honest, brutally honest with you and with myself, everything that gets stirred up in the presence of nothingness leads to a lot of questions. Have you ever noticed how that happens in your life? And is this happening to you too right now? I remember vividly taking a course in my second year of college that was going to count as one of my history credits. It was a cross-disciplinary course. I don't remember much of the details of the papers that I wrote. I barely recall what the professor looked like or sounded like, but I do remember one specific lesson from the class. You see, this particular course was on the study of medieval southwestern European artwork just prior to the Renaissance. Very specific. Something you would only find in an undergraduate college setting, I think. We looked at, at paintings and tried to understand what they conveyed historically. Who would pay for them and why did they last and what made them important? And then we also looked at them form critically from the standpoint of art. As I said, I remember almost nothing about the class except that I took it. The one lesson I do remember from this class was that negative space allows for the asking of questions and the opening up of interpretations, whereas positive space simply provides the answers. I remember the lesson because when I got to seminary and started studying the theology of prayer and worship, I heard the same lesson again. Negative space, that is silence, provides room for the other to speak, 
for questions to be asked and for interpretation to be open to happening. Positive space, or talking, seeks to provide the answers, or at least the content of the conversation, and very little content or conversation actually happens in the midst of our own talking. This statement feels pretty ironic right about now in this message, but it is what it is. That brings me back to where I am right now. I'm sitting here in this great, big, empty space sharing this message with you. And when you're here in this sanctuary by an artist, that might be considered positive space, at least an, an image of this place. But in your absence, it might be considered artistically to be negative space. Now, it's not value judgments that I'm placing on this physical space, but it's your presence or your absence which completes or empties a picture. It feels a lot like this chair that's been sitting here next to me the whole time I've been preaching. Up until this point, have you found yourself wondering, why is there an empty chair next to Nathan? Did he forget to move it off of the stage? You know, it's been in every shot so far. That chair being empty reminds me of the chairs I've experienced in my life at Thanksgivings or family gatherings when a beloved family member has passed away in the previous year. When they aren't with us any longer, it creates this sort of negative space and it invites a lot of questions and feelings and even soul searching. This season that we currently find ourselves in is a sort of negative space for many people. Maybe we understand that in the way that we talked about last week is a value judgment, sort of a space that gets filled up with the worst bits of ourselves. But this week I want to take a look at the presence of nothing from a more artistic perspective. It's like a negative space that invites a lot of questions and soul searching potentially. You see, that's one of the upsides of nothing that we're going to be talking about in this series. When nothing is present, we can ask a lot of the really big questions. As I'm in here preaching right now and during the week, a lot of questions have come up in my mind, big questions, at least for me. Questions like, what is my role as a pastor? What am I supposed to be doing during this time? What am I doing with my life? How am I being a good husband? How about, how am I being a good father? How can I be a better friend? Is my character in the absence of the spotlight right now what I want it to be? Or is there something that I need to be doing better? Is there some way that I should be embodying Christ more fully? Maybe you found yourself asking some of these same questions. Maybe you found yourself having a crisis of personality or of faith or of character. Maybe you found the big questions have become obscured by emergent questions like, how will I eat today? How will I survive? Where will I live? And then there's this pair of questions. What about the world, the way it is right now, reflects God's righteousness and kingdom well? And what about the world right now and even before this virus spread reflects the brokenness of the world and prevents God's kingdom from being seen? And what's more, how do I and we personally impact the coming of God's kingdom in the world? When I start asking questions about nothing, I shared in last week's message that I tend to look at Paul's letter of joy, one of the letters that he wrote while he was in prison, the letter to the Philippians. This letter of Paul's just drips of joy, but given the context out of which it emerged, I think it has the potential to speak into our lives today as well. Remember, it was written during Paul's multi-year incarceration as part of the process that would eventually take him to Rome and see him eventually be executed in the Roman capital. This letter could be full of darkness and despair, but Paul was staring at the void and the void was staring back and his letter still drips of joy. He knew his time was coming, but we don't find any of that darkness in it. We find a man with nothing but time on his hands and we read page after page of the joy that filled his heart. We heard last week the secret to his joy was knowing that even in nothing, 
Jesus was still with him. And that helped keep him from slipping and giving into that thorn in his flesh as he described it. We might think of that thorn in the flesh as the darker side of our nature. But the question facing us today is what could he have to say to us about how we can approach asking the larger questions in life during a time such as this? Well, the answer is quite a lot, actually. Paul was at the point in his life where he had nothing in it and he had very little to nothing ahead of him. Yet he provided a roadmap of how he considered and approached the big questions in life. Hear these words again that I read before this morning's message from Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 27. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. You may have missed it before, and you might have missed it again just now, but I invite you to focus in on the questions that Paul is addressing here. He's confronting questions like this. How should we live our faith? What difference does our faith make if even you are facing certain death? And the answer Paul gives is, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ and stand firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel and show you are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. In essence, this is saying, look, the void is going to come after you. Darkness and death will stalk you. People will even tell you negative space is your enemy. But live your life according to and in Jesus Christ. Our situation doesn't dictate who we are. We are who God tells us we are. Not only that, and not only is Jesus always with us, but as long as we are living in him, we are with each other in this. What's more, the nothingness will ask us questions back, and none is more important than, who are you? And maybe that's the question that you've been wrestling with right now. Maybe you're wrestling with the question, who am I? What do I do now? Well, Paul actually wrote about that too, because those questions couldn't escape him in his time alone with nothing. He wrote in chapter two of his letter to the Philippians, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Who am I? Well, I'm a follower of Jesus, but more than that, I am completely in him. I am not better than others. I have his spirit and his heart in me. Though I may be alone with my own thoughts and my own nothingness, I have the same mind in me. My life, though perhaps isolated and limited, is lived for others. But what should I be doing with my life? Well, Paul thought about that too. Not that he gives an answer for each of us, but his answer for all of us is simply this. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Hold fast to the word of life, Jesus the Christ, and do all that we do for him, and our labor will not be in vain. Now, I know that these don't provide any one of us the specific answer to the question, who am I? Who is Nathan Carlson? What does it mean to be a pastor? Am I a pastor? N those are my questions, but it does let me know a few things about those questions. First, that in my searching, my character is still rooted in Jesus Christ, and who I am will not stray far afield from that. 
Second, that in my longing to figure out what I must do, I know that I must do it for others, because that is the mind that's in Christ Jesus. Third, that if I am to be a pastor, that I must be able to do this for the glory of Christ. These are the three ways this helps me answer those questions. You and I aren't the same person, thankfully so, or life would be very, very boring. But we do need this help and this reminder as we question the void to know that we aren't doing it ex nihilo or with nothing on our side. In fact, as we face nothing, we're not facing nothing with nothing. God has already stacked up our side of the equation so that we face nothing with something, the presence of Christ, and some of these answers about what our character is to be like already rooted inside of us. I know at least a dozen people, if not more, who throughout this time of physical distancing have been furloughed or let go from their job. Some people got let go before this even happened. And some of them have shared with me their struggles and the pain of self-examination, of asking the big questions about life's purpose and meaning. One of my closest friends said to me after getting let go from his job, this is all I've ever done. I've never had to ask who I am without this. But what I discovered when I faced the prospect of having nothing to look forward to is that God designed me to delight in something else entirely. And I never would have had the opportunity to discover that had this not happened to me. He's now going back to school so that he can completely change his life and live according to his calling so that what he does in his life will glorify God and stir up that glory in his soul, that awe, that wonder, that purpose that God designed him to have. And it's all because he received an opportunity in his life to pause, to ask the big questions. For most of us, for most of our lives, we start doing something and we just don't stop. We don't get to experience the blessing that nothing can bring. You know, in a time of nothing with lots of artistically negative space, we can ask the big questions of ourselves and our lives and our faith. We can examine who we want to be and how we want our world to be. We can look for the deeper truths inside ourselves. Nothing can be a blessing because it doesn't impose its own answers upon us, but provides us space to freshly interpret the word of God and the nature of ourselves in this world. Perhaps that's why some people have committed themselves to trying to make their lives healthier or more well-rounded in some way during this time, whether it be through exercise or Bible study or prayer or even learning how to cook. Now, I confess that last one has started stirring in my own soul, and I, I did make a mean batch of macaroni and cheese earlier this week uh, based off of a gourmet recipe I found. Nothing provides space for us to ask those questions, though. And we know that Christ is with us even in that search. When we face nothing, we aren't starting from nothing. And that should empower us to find the answers for which our heart longs. My prayer for you this week is simply this. Be bold and courageous in asking the big questions. If you don't like what your answers to those questions were before all of this happened, well... Nothing is standing in your way from changing that. May it be so in your life this week. And may we find it so in all of ours. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. Lord, we might view it as a negative, as something is missing from our lives. It might feel like a drain, like an anchor on our soul sometimes. But if we simply look at it differently... If we reframe that negative as being negative space, we find that it opens up in our hearts and our lives an opportunity, an opportunity to find answers of you and within ourselves, of ways of living, Lord, that more closely reflect the nature of your kingdom and who you designed us to be. Help us to find those answers 
this week and give us the strength to ask those questions. We ask this in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
it's that time again, time for this morning's tithes, gifts, and offerings. We have three different ways that we can give to the church during this coronavirus outbreak. Uh, we can use the church uh, webpage, uh, oakhurstumc.com, with a link there. We can use our smartphone apps, the Oakhurst Church app. Uh, Anna and I have found that to be the best way to make our contributions to the church. And uh, that's available uh, through the App Store. If you don't have it already, I encourage you to, to do that. You can also register your attendance that way. And the third way, of course, is to send a church a check. I want to thank everybody for your faithfulness in giving to the church. If that is a reflection of how you're doing in your prayer time and your Bible reading, then I think we are making a good uh, step in redeeming this time to make it somehow valuable. Uh, even though we are separated and even though we are inconvenienced, I think we are at least being faithful to God in our disciplines and in our giving, and that's a wonderful thing. So I uh, want to invite you, if you've already uh, taken out your uh, phone and made your gift to the church, or if you would like to uh, uh, get out a checkbook and maybe we'll say a prayer of blessing over that. But uh, in the meantime, let us now join together for a word of prayer as I consecrate the offerings. Let us pray. Lord God, in your infinite wisdom, in your knowledge of us, and your knowledge of what is good for us and what is right for us, you command us to give offerings each week, not as much because you need those offerings or want uh, us to support the ministry of the church, which of course you do, but also because you know what is good for us and you know that in the giving, our hearts are softened, our spirits are made more alive and more aware. So we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to worship you through the giving of our tithes and gifts and offerings. We pray that you truly would use these gifts, tithes and offerings that we give to soften our hearts and liven our spirits but especially also to aid the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ here at our church, Oakhurst, and through our church, in our community, in our state, and around the world. Thank you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
let us receive our benediction. Almighty God, we are so grateful for this negative space, the openness, the nothingness that allows us to explore the bigger questions that we have in our lives and about you. So Lord, let this be a fruitful time for our spirits and getting to know you and ourselves and the way that you have designed us and created us and called us. We ask this and that we would feel your presence and hear your voice as we go from this service today. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for joining us. 